Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader by C.S. Lewis. So this is number five chronologically in the Narnia series. I know you can also read them in publication order, but basically I got this box set. I don't know if you can see it, but they all have numbers on the side there. So I've just been reading them through in that order. I'm going to quickly go over the blurb before I go through, and then I'm going to go through some of my tabs. So, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, a voyage to the very ends of the world. A king and some unexpected companions embark on a voyage that will take them beyond all known lands. As they sail farther and farther from charted waters, they discover that their quest is more than they imagine and that the world's end is only the beginning. So I didn't quite enjoy this as much as the last one, Prince Caspian, possibly because I don't I don't like the sea and I don't like water and I don't like being on water. So I guess maybe I don't particularly like reading about it either. However, it was good that it still had Edmund and Lucy in it. Uh, two of the characters from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and Prince Caspian. And overall, it was alright. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as The Horse and His Boy. I would probably put this on a par with The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and then the Prince Caspian and the Magician's Nephew have been my two favourites so far. But yeah, let's go through and start looking at some of the tabs in this and see what I thought of it. Okay, so we start off with this kid called Eustace, who is basically the Edmund of this book. And what I don't like is that C.S. Lewis basically portrays his family as bad because they're vegetarians and odd smokers and teetotalers. Let me read this opening paragraph out. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. His parents called him Eustace Clarence, and masters called him Scrub. I can't tell you how his friends spoke to him, for he had none. He didn't call his father and mother, father and mother, but Harold and Alberta. They were very up-to-date and advanced people. They were vegetarians, non-smokers and teetotalers and wore a special kind of underclothes. In their house there was very little furniture and very few clothes on beds and the windows were always open. So right at the start of this book just makes me get annoyed. <laughs> and then there's this painting, a picture in the bedroom of a ship and uh, it feels very realistic and of course it's a picture of the Dawn Treader and it turns into a doorway to Narnia. Um, but they're looking at it here and it says, She was obviously running fast before a gay wind, listing over a little on her port side. By the way, if you're going to read this story at all, and if you don't know already, you'd better get it into your head that the left of a ship when you are looking ahead is port, and the right is starboard. Yeah, get it into your head. If you don't get it into your head, you can't read this book. Here we have a little bit of uh, further explanation of how the like time dilation between Narnia and our world works. I have to say I'm still not convinced by it. Hey, Rhinelf, said Caspian to one of the sailors. Bring spiced wine for their majesties. You'll need something to warm you after that dip. He called Edmund and Lucy their majesties because they and Peter and Susan had all been kings and queens of Narnia long before his time. Narnian time flows differently from ours. If you spent a hundred years in Narnia, you would still come back to our world at the very same hour of the very same day on which you left. And then, if you went back to Narnia after spending a week here, you might find that a thousand Narnian years had passed, or only a day, or no time at all. You never know till you got there. But it's kind of irritating that, because for a start, Caspian met them before on their last adventure, which was a year ago. And then there was a year between that and the previous adventure where like hundreds if not thousands of years had passed. So there's like no consistency to the way the time works in this and it does bother me a bit. Just because I think when you're dealing with things like that you can do it really well and C.S. Lewis just sort of swept it under the carpet and didn't bother almost. And uh, this builds on some backstory from the previous book as well. So it says here, Well, said Caspian, that's rather a long story. Perhaps you remember that when I was a child, my usurping uncle Miraz got rid of seven friends of my father's, who might have taken my part, by sending them off to explore the unknown eastern seas beyond the Lone Islands. And basically, on his coronation day, he swore that he was going to sail east himself for a year and a day to find his father's friends, or to learn of their deaths and avenge them if he could. Then Eustace is feeling seasick, and so Lucy uses the gift that she had of like the little curing, it's like a cure potion inside a little like flask, and she wastes it on Eustace's seasickness. The little shit's probably faking it anyway. Don't worry, he does have a redemption arc. Doesn't make me like his character anymore though. And then you get Eustace being a little clunge, so it says here, uh, he meets, uh, what's his name, Reaper Cheap, who is, I believe, a cat? Or maybe a rat, I don't know, it's, a, it's an animal that's good at sword fighting anyway. Anyway, as soon as he saw that long tail hanging down, and perhaps it was rather tempting, he thought it would be like, delightful to catch hold of it, swing Reaper Cheap round by it once or twice upside down, then run away and laugh. Okay, so it is a mouse, but it's the, the size of a large cat. Who does that? Who looks at an animal and thinks, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to torture that animal. It's rather tempting. So I don't know, I feel as though a lot of the things that Lewis has written about in these, like, betray his own 
his own opinions towards animals. Like, he talks about how glorious hunting is. He does at least get his ass kicked by this mouse, though. I'm not sure whether this is foreshadowing or not, but uh, it says here, um... I never understood why they belonged to Narnia, said Caspian. Did Peter the High King conquer them? We're talking about the Lone Islands here. Oh no, said Edmund. They were Narnian before our time, in the days of the White Witch. By the way, I have never yet heard how these remote islands became attached to the crown of Narnia. If I ever do, and the story is at all interesting, I may put it in some other book. I guess he didn't, because if these are chronologically speaking, that would have already have happened, you know? Really bothers me here, they uh, meet somebody and Caspian says, So that's what you are, a kidnapper and slaver. I hope you're proud of it. Now, 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 said the slaver. Don't you start any jaw. The easier you take it, the pleasanter all round, see? I hate that word, pleasanter. And I think, grammatically speaking, it is correct as opposed to more pleasant, but it just sounds wrong, and every time I see it in a book, it winds me up. And then Caspian gets bought by, like, a slave master or whatever. And the guy goes, you needn't be afraid of me, boy. I'll treat you well. I bought you for your face. You reminded me of someone. May I ask, may I ask of whom, my lord, said Caspian. You remind me of my master, King Caspian of Narnia. Then Caspian decided to risk everything on one stroke. My lord, he said, I am your master. I am Caspian, King of Narnia. There seems to be a lot of, um, throughout the Narnia series, a lot of, like, people getting confused about who other people are and stuff, because that was in The Horse and His Boy as well, which was basically a poor retelling of um, The Prince and the Pauper. This this line, I thought it said something else when I first read it. So a character called Pug says, Does your good majesty mean to beggar me? I thought it was a U, not an E. And then we have uh, Lucy here. She's playing chess with Reaper Cheap, the, uh, the mouse. She spent a good deal of time sitting on the little bench in the stern playing chess with Reaper Cheap. It was amusing to see him lifting the pieces, which were far too big for him, with both paws and standing on tiptoes if he made a move near the centre of the board. He was a good player, and re when he remembered what he was doing, he usually won. But every now and then, Lucy won because the mouse did something quite ridiculous, like sending a knight into the danger of a queen and castle combined. This happened because he had momentarily forgotten it was a game of chess and was thinking of a real battle, and making the knight do what he would certainly have done in its place. For his mind was full of forlorn hopes, death or glory charges, and last stands. You gotta forgive it of a talking mouse though. And then you have Edmund just being a little dick. Still becalmed, very short rations for dinner, and I got less than anyone. This is in his diary. Captain is very clever at helping and thinks I don't see. Lucy for some reason tried to make up to me by offering me some of hers, but that interfering prig Edmund wouldn't let her. Pretty hot sun, terribly thirsty all evening. And then the 6th of September, two days later. A horrible day. Woke up in the night knowing I was feverish and must have a drink of water. Any doctor would have said so. Heaven knows I'm the last person to try to get any unfair advantage, but I never dreamed that this water rationing would be meant to apply to a sick man. In fact, I would have woken the others up and asked for some, only I thought it would be selfish to wake them, as opposed to being selfish to take their rations. Here he is, on the 8th of September, still sailing east. I stay in my bunk all day now and see no one except Lucy till the two fiends come to bed. Lucy gives me a little of a water ration. She says girls don't get as thirsty as boys. I had often thought this, but it ought to be more generally known at sea. No, she has given you her water ration because you keep bitching about it and you're actually putting her life at risk for your own selfishness. And then he walks off as well and gets himself into trouble. Uh, and he sees this thing and it's, uh, it says here, let's see. The thing that came out of the cave was something he had never even imagined. A long lead coloured snout, dull red eyes, no feathers or fur. A long lithe body that trailed on the ground. Legs whose elbows went up higher than its back like a spider's. Cruel claws, bat's wings that made a rasping noise on the stones. Yards of tail and the lines of smoke were coming from its two nostrils. He never said the word dragon to himself, nor would it have made things any better if he had. And this is because Eustace has never heard of dragons. And apparently that's a thing. You can believe that a child has never heard of dragons. This was worse than in um, The Boy with the Striped Pajamas, where the kid who lived in Nazi Germany in Berlin in 1938 had never heard of Hitler. So here we go, some more about this, because of course he doesn't know what a dragon is. Most of us know what we should expect to find in a dragon's lair, but, as I said before, Eustace had read only the wrong books. They had a lot to say about exports and imports and governments and drains, but they were weak on dragons. That is why he was so puzzled at the surface on which he was lying. Parts of it were too prickly to be stones and too hard to be thorns, and there seemed to be a great many round, flat things, and it all clinked when he moved. There was light enough at the cave's mouth to examine it by, and of course Eustace found it to be what any of us would, could have told him in advance. Treasure. There were crowns, those were the prickly things. Coins, rings, bracelets, ingots, cups, plates, and gems. And then predictably, because this is how children think, he was like, huh, there's no tax here. 
And then he turns into a dragon, because sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy, dragonish thoughts in his heart made him become a dragon himself. But he was confused as well, because he, he thought he'd seen his own ref uh, he thought he'd seen another dragon, and it was just his own reflection. And this is pretty grim, this paragraph here as well. He took a long drink, and then, I know this sounds shocking, but it isn't if you think it over. He ate nearly all the dead dragon. He was halfway through it before he realised what he was doing, for, you see, though his mind was the mind of Eustace, his tastes and his digestion were dragonish. And there is nothing a dragon likes so well as fresh dragon. That's why you so seldom find more than one dragon in the same county. So dragons are cannibals. And then it turns out that one of the people they were after uh, was the dragon. Or perhaps this is the Lord Optesian turned into a dragon under enchantment, you know. And uh, they realise that it's Eustace. And then they have to try and turn him back. So we have this paragraph here. But of course what hung over everyone like a cloud was the problem of what to do with their dragon when they were ready to sail. They tried not to talk of it when he was there, but he couldn't help overhearing things like, would he fit all along one side of the deck? And we'd have to shift all the stores to the other side down below so as to balance. Or, would towing him be any good? Or, would he be able to keep up by flying? And most often of all, but how are we to feed him? And poor Eustace realised more and more that since the first day he came on board he had been an unmitigated nuisance, and that he was now a greater nuisance still. And this ate into his mind, just as that bracelet ate into his foreleg. He knew that it only made it worse to tear at it with his great teeth, but he couldn't help tearing now and then, especially on hot nights. So there are practicalities there, but this is also when he starts to realise what a little shit he is and starts to come round to being a bit of a better person. And then Aslan realises that what they need to do, they need to peel the scales off. And it's not very pleasant, it's quite painful, so it says here, Well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done it myself the other three times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker, and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And there was I as smooth and soft as a peeled switch, and smaller than I had been. Then he caught hold of me. I didn't like that much, for I was very tender underneath it now that I had no skin on, and threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that it became perfectly delicious, and as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone from my arm. And then I saw why. I'd turned into a boy again. You'd think me simply phony if I told you how I felt about my own arms. I know they've no muscle and are pretty mouldy compared with Caspian's, but I was so glad to see them. Alright, Holden Caulfield. Hello, Biggie. Cat's here. You're going to be in the video. Oh, and then they, they see this pool as well, and anything that goes into the pool turns into gold. Uh, so Edmund says, because they're trying to get like this spear of gold out of it, and uh, Edmund says it turned the spear into gold, and that's why it got so heavy. And it was just lapping against my feet. It's a good thing I wasn't barefoot. And it turned the toe caps into gold. And so that poor fellow on the bottom, well, you see. So it isn't a statue at all, said Lucy in a low voice. So that's almost like touching on the King Midas myth, isn't it? And then they go to the island of the voices and there are basically these invisible people there who were kind of very vain and then a magician turned them ugly and they decided they'd rather be invisible completely than ugly. And then they like have to, you know, restore the ability to see these people. I'm going to read this little paragraph here from The Magician's Book. So this is when they've gone to eat with these people. The invisible people feasted their guests royally. It was very funny to see the plates and dishes come into the table and not see anyone carrying them. It would have been funny even if they had moved along level with the floor, as you would expect things to do in invisible hands. But they didn't. They progressed up the long dining hall in a series of bounds or jumps. At the highest point of each jump, a dish would be about 15 feet up in the air. Then it would come down and stop quite suddenly about three feet from the floor. When the dish contained anything like soup or stew, the result was rather disastrous. Can you imagine that, Biggie, if we tried to do that with your cat food? Also, uh, Susan reads this, this magic spell book and she reads a story in it that's like the ultimate story. And so she's talking about it here. She says, oh, what a shame. I did so want to read it again. Well, at least I must remember it. Let's see. It was about, about, oh dear, it's all fading away again. And even this last page is going blank. This is a very queer book. How can I have forgotten? It was about a cup and a sword and a tree and a green hill, I know that much. But I can't remember and what shall I do? And she never could remember. And ever since that day, what Lucy means by a good story is a story which reminds her of the forgotten story in the magician's book. And that reminds me of Tenacious D. And we played the first thing that came to our heads and it just so happened to be. We also get the, uh, the knife of stone and uh, Eustace says, what is this knife of stone? And the girl replies, do none of you know it? I, I think, said Lucy, I've seen something like it before. It was a knife like it that the white witch used when she killed Aslan at the stone table long ago. 
which happened in The Lion, Witch and the Wardrobe. So it's cool that these things come back, you know? I like this as well, so I'm just going to read this little exchange. And what are we to do about the sleepers, asked Caspian. In the world from which my friends come, here he nodded at Eustace and the Pevensies, they have a story of a prince or a king coming to a castle where all the people lay in an enchanted sleep. In that story, he could not dissolve the enchantment until he had kissed the princess. But here, said the girl, it is different. Here he cannot kiss the princess till he has dissolved the enchantment. Which is good. That adds a layer of consent to it, which I think we can all agree is a good thing. I like this as well. They meet this old man and um, he says, I saw them long ago, but it was from a great height. I cannot tell you such things as sailors need to know. Do you mean you were flying in the air? Eustace blurted out. I was a long way above the air, my son, replied the old man. I am Ramandu, but I see that you stare at one another and have not heard this name. And no wonder, for the days when I was a star had ceased long before any of you knew this world, and all the constellations have changed. Golly, said Edmund under his breath, he's a retired star. I imagine it's quite difficult to get a new job if you're a retired star. You can't really retrain, can you? I'm going to read this little extract. It's just a sentence here that says, So that before the half hour was nearly over, several people were positively sucking up to Drinian and Rince. At least that was what they called it at my school, to get a good report. That's also what they called it at my school as well. And then we get this little exchange here, right at the end. Please, Aslan, said Lucy. Before we go, will you tell us when we can come back to Narnia again, please? And oh, do, do, do make it soon. Dearest, said Aslan very gently, you and your brother will never come back to Narnia. Oh, Aslan, said Edmund and Lucy, both together in despairing voices. You are two old children, said Aslan, and you must begin to come close to your own world now. And so that leaves me wondering what's going to happen in books six and seven, which I still have to go as well. But yeah, I did enjoy this one. It wasn't as good as Prince Caspian or the Magician's Nephew. I enjoyed it on a par with The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. So I'm going to rate it now. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. So as always, thanks a lot for coming along and watching my review. Let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.